Okay, so hi everyone and thank you for being with us here and online and uh, welcome to this small workshop that uh, our working group at RISC organized for you. So um, uh, I will maybe start by getting to know the people who are attending with us and then I will explain a little bit about the purpose of this workshop. So we'll be together for two hours and it's good maybe to have your name and uh, your work and maybe for those online to say where you are um, based at the moment and then I'll, I will also listen uh, we'll listen to the people with me in the room to present themselves only name and uh, position please. so I'll start with Valeria and then we'll go around Good afternoon, uh, good morning, good evening to all of you. Um, my name is Valeria Kunz. I'm the head of education in Save the Children in Switzerland, normally based in Zurich. And I'm also um, the uh, convener of the RESI EIE working group, um, which has organized the events today. Thanks. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Consuelo Guardia. I'm a research assistant at the University of Geneva. Uh, I'm also in a working group on the Geneva Hub, but not this one. Uh, I'm an adopted person here, and um, and I do research on education emergencies. And I work. Uh, my PhD is also about that subject. Thanks. Greetings. My name is Sarah Habibi, and I'm a researcher and practitioner in peace building through education and learning solutions specialist at the Peace Division of UNITAR. Hello, my name is Sarah Yenes, and I'm an intern at HELCO. <laughs> hi, hi everybody, my name is Chiara, I'm the director of HELCO Switzerland. I'm not a technical one here, I normally do fundraising, so I'm here to learn. My name is Katrin Baumann and I'm a program officer at Right to Play Switzerland. Normally also, our office is based in Zurich. But I am based in Geneva because I used to work in Geneva before, and it's nice to meet you all. Hello, my name is Anne Malaprat Miladinov. I'm working at the University of Geneva and collaborating with Inzon and part of this uh, RESI work group. Hi, everyone. My name is Amy, and I'm a project coordinator with IRAG. And my project is working on the intersectoral collaboration between education and other SDGs, and particularly between peace and democracy, which is why I'm here today. Hi, everyone. My name is Mathilde. I also work with NORAG, uh, but I work for a project of backstopping mandate to the SDC, Education Department of the SDC. Hello, my name is Tamar Gabelnik. Um, I direct a, a small foundation called the Sala Foundation, which focuses on um, access to education for vulnerable, vulnerable girls. And um, I am a new RISI member, and uh, so I'm here to learn today. Hello, everyone. So I'm Dana Kajisis, Education and Child Protection Specialist at the University of Children's Prison. Great. So I may go. Finish with myself. So I'm Ola Boamsha. I'm just moderating here. I'm a member of RESI and I work at INEE, the Inter Network Agency for Education Emergencies. So um, maybe some are you able to, to yes. give us just an overview of who is joining with us? I see Noemi Krauer uh, from World Vision Switzerland. Um, we have Lisa from Save the Children Switzerland. We have Andrea from the Swiss Academy for Development. And um, I think we have some others as well. <laughs> I see Sami from the Pedagogical University of Zurich. Um, I see colleagues from World Vision in Uganda who are also presenting. Um, yeah. If you can just maybe also add your names and positions in the chat for those who are online, uh, so we can also um, meet you. And there is sign up from SDC in Lebanon, welcome. Uh, and others are probably to join. Right. But let's yeah. move on. Ah, yeah, Fabian, would you like to also introduce yourself? <laughs> I'm sorry to be late. I'm Fabian Lachie, and I work for the uh, uh, the NORAG as a back support for the education team in SDC, the Swiss Agency for Development Cooperation. Thanks a lot. 
Okay, so we have a very nice group here and online, so let's start. So um, for those maybe who are joining and who are not very aware of RACI, RACI is the Swiss network for education and uh, international cooperation. And we have mainly at the moment two working groups. One of them is the working group in education emergencies uh, that uh, Valeria is um, leading and that we are, most of us are part of it. Uh, so we decided together that we would like to talk about the triple nexus and learn how education can be supported in this with this new approach. And we decided that maybe our, a short workshop will be um, useful for many of us. So today we invited uh, Sarah Clark Haribi, an, um, an expert in peace education, to present the context the concept and the, the, the application to education uh, of the triple nexus. And then we will have three interventions with programmatic um, 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 inputs for, uh, our, for projects from different countries related to uh, using or working the approach of the triple nexus. So we will have short presentations of 10 minutes each and then we will have questions and answers after that, and we will have some group work. So we will interact with the concept and uh, discuss among us online and uh, here in the room. So let's start first with uh, Dr. Habibi. Can you please come in and hear and uh, explain to us what is this mysterious nexus? Thank Wonderful. You. Thank you so much, Ula. And uh, the concept of triple nexus is familiar probably to many people, but I thought it would be helpful just to give a brief overview so we're working with the same terminology. So very briefly, triple nexus refers to this uh, interlinkage, increased interlinkage between uh, humanitarian development and peace uh, building sectors and actors. This is uh, an evolution in the nexus thinking. Um, in the last couple of years, which emerged from the World Humanitarian Summit in 2016. It's not new, though. The nexus between development and humanitarian work has been a uh, priority for many years now. Um, but bringing in the peace dimension, especially, um, and uh, elaborating our, our understanding of how to operationalize the nexus is uh, a priority, policy priority now for the international community. So we're looking at this coordination, um, which really focuses on strengthening collaboration, coherence and complementarity between these actors and these sectors so that we can more effectively respond to the needs of populations in fragile and conflict affected contexts. So why do we need a triple nexus approach? I think it's fairly obvious we're all working in this field. Um, Conflicts and crises are becoming increasingly complex and hard to end. We understand that humanitarian crises last for oftentimes decades. This creates a, 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 an incredible pressure on humanitarian resources and also tensions with development priorities and uh, existing established um, education systems and how to respond to the needs of host communities and refugee populations at the same time and also looking at other factors such as climate change, economic development, and the, the uh, establishing uh, better life outcomes for populations that are affected by fragility. We also notice that there's a resurgence pardon of uh, violent conflicts. And so, sorry, thank you. The triple nexus approach um, calls upon us to um, adopt a new way of working. And what does this mean? This essentially means that uh, taking a, a more conscious approach, a more systemic and operational approach to bridging the humanitarian development and peace divides. And specifically, it means finding ways to operationalize the creation of collective programmatic outcomes across our organizations adopting as much as possible multi-year timeframes, and learning how to better leverage the comparative advantage or special uh, skills and competences and unique uh, resources of each organization. And this is really the heart of it, and this is the challenge. It's about moving past single issues 
and trying to look at comprehensive integrated uh, uh, interventions with agency specific work plans. It's about overcoming these institutional silos and fragmented funding and trying to develop an operational framework um, that more effectively meets human needs, mitigating risks and vulnerabilities and moving towards sustainability by promoting resilience in emergency and protracted crisis contexts. So it's about also focusing more on prevention and coherent engagement and sustainability. Now that all sounds very attractive, but how do we actually do it? Mm -hmm. um, and that's part of the challenge of also shifting the international kind of uh, standard way of working, which um, presents a number of challenges. So this is the overarching challenge here. Of if we could summarize it in one question, how can humanitarian development and peace actors work more effectively together not only to achieve their respective technical outcomes, but also in so doing, strengthen resilience, mitigate risk, conflict and crisis, and support sustainable peace building. So um, moving more specifically into the uh, role of education in this triple nexus, um, the, two, the two interact with each other. Um, education, is a field which touches in each of these areas. It is a humanitarian concern. It's definitely a development concern. And we have increasingly understood over the last couple of decades how it is a peace building and security concern. So education is really the heart and center of all actors across the triple nexus. And the efficacy or inefficacy of the triple nexus also has an impact on education. The more we learn to work at the triple nexus, the more we're going to have a comprehensive approach to understanding the educational needs of populations. And the less we understand the triple nexus, the more education actors are going to have difficulties because we're going to be re-encountering the same challenges over and over again. So it goes without saying, of course, that education is a human right. It's also a sustainable development goal and priority. And we also know that the conditions in the world at the moment are um, putting extensive pressure on education actors and on children and youth and throughout the life cycle to achieve good education outcomes. It goes without saying millions are out of school, the pandemic made it worse, and um, fragmented education and poor learning outcomes are um, the, the sad prospect for too many of the world's population. So we need to be looking for educational alternatives. We need to be looking for how to build more resilient and inclusive systems. And we need to look at more peace responsive provision. So this is why adopting a triple nexus lens becomes very important for us. We have to find ways to have collective action across these areas to build more adaptable and inclusive education systems, respond to crises, and ensure that all young people get the education and job skills and, uh, and life skills that they need. Now, more specifically, this new way of working calls upon multiple actors. We could add others here. We could add academia and research. We could add think tanks. We could add um, uh, advocacy organizations. We could add uh, diplomacy, etc. But how do we bring this range of actors and their comparative advantage, their unique perspective on education into a coherent way of working? So this again, yeah, underscores the need to understand our complementary functions. And if we can proceed to the next slide, more specifically, um, developing new ways of working around uh, joint analyses of contexts and populations and needs. How do we bring our organizations together to pool information, um, to assess the needs together? How do we come together to articulate a coherent vision of resilient communities and to articulate collective outcomes that our different organizations can jointly pursue? How do we make sure that planning um, avoids some of the common pitfalls, such as uh, doubling over each other and having contradictory programs of action? How do we um, bring together in complementary programming our various strengths in uh, joint implementation as well as monitoring and evaluation? Oftentimes we're doubling efforts here and we're not sharing information. 
And of course, it calls upon us together to lobby, but also if we're in the position of doing financing to think about financing in more flexible and long term ways. So here's another articulation of that um, joint analysis, joint planning, joint implementation or common or yeah, you can use the keyword that you like finding ways to work together more as a cohesive body with a collective brain instead of in silos. Thank you very much. And on the next slide, we see here one example um, of how joint, how the triple nexus was applied in the case of um, the northern community of Tripoli and Lebanon. So in this community, um, there were a lot of risks and vulnerabilities and challenges related with the needs of host communities and both long term refugees and an, an intensive influx of refugees from neighboring Syria. So um, uh, four UN agencies gathered together to undertake um, a common uh, needs assessment. The first step was to bring the agencies together. The next step was to, to identify who were the stakeholders that needed to be there. And together they held multi-stakeholder assessments um, to un with um, community actors, uh, national and international NGOs and government authorities. And the, from out of that uh, shared analysis process, they developed neighborhood profiles and articulated the needs of the communities in these different neighborhoods. From there, that was able to influence the program priorities and outcomes that they decided to jointly pursue, each contributing their um, advantage to the realization of those goals. So we saw here WASH programs, vocational training and women uh, for women and women's employment, and um, local development and social cohesion, touching on each aspect of the triple nexus. Yes, and just to wrap up, um, as I said at the beginning, this way of working as a priority is not new, but probably the dimension that uh, is sometimes harder to pursue or maybe uh, can be integrated to a higher degree is understanding peace responsiveness among humanitarian actors, among develop act development actors, and, uh, and among uh, peace building actors also. How do we bring a peace responsive, a peace building lens beyond do no harm, beyond uh, uh, conflict sensitivity into the reflection at every stage. And the underlying point here is that for education, um, and we know it all in this room, irrelevant or inequitable education can drive conflict dynamics. And furthermore, peace cannot be built by peace builders alone. So having this internal reflection in each organization is also really key. Some lines of action that we might want to think about, and I'm sure we're going to hear about in the case examples, are how to integrate peace building principles and processes into humanitarian and development agendas and frameworks. How do we go about building capacity both within our organizations to work with the triple nexus and also in the communities and with our partners that we're collaborating with? And how do we actually shift our organizational and operational practices and our management approaches to projects to be more responsive uh, through a triple nexus approach? So thank you very much. Um, I'm sure that we're going to hear some wonderful examples. I pass back to uh, Ula. Thank you. thank you very much. Thank you for this uh, in, in clearing. On, on the triple nexus and how we make uh, education at the heart of it and peace at the heart of also all the development and the humanitarian uh, action that we are making. So our next presentation will be with um, Samuel already, who will be joining us online. I, I saw his name earlier. So Samuel, are you still with us? So Samuel is uh, the program man, area program manager from Uganda, and he works with World Vision. So he will tell us about how Triple Nexus uh, applies in their context and uh, how they are working in a, a specific um, refugee camp in Omugo, in the north of Uganda. Samuel, over to you. Yes, uh, thank you so much. Um, and uh, greetings to everyone on the call. Yes, um, so happy to be part of uh, this platform. Um, my name is Samuel Holwen. 
I'm uh, Area Program Coordinator for World Vision Program uh, in Omugo, uh, World Vision Uganda. I'm happy to be having uh, other colleagues from World Vision Uganda uh, on the call. So learning from um, uh, our program's experience uh, about uh, education in emergency, but of course with insights uh, to triple nexus aspects, uh, World Vision Uganda and, and, and Uganda as a country hosts uh, approximately 1, 1, 1.5 million refugees. A majority of uh, these refugees are Southern Sudanese and uh, they are hosted in Uganda, majorly as a result of uh, conflict in Southern Sudan. So Omugo settlement uh, in this discussion uh, is an extension of a rhino settlement as one of the eight uh, refugee settlements uh, refugee housing settlements within the within the the, the western part of uh, uh, the Nile River in Uganda. Omugo hosts um, 143,000 refugees uh, in the in this extension, and about triple nexus. Just as uh, we've heard uh, from the 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 four presentation, uh, humanitarian assistance programming of World Vision in Uganda is uh, informed by uh, protracted refugee uh, situations. And um, the global consensus uh, um, in this case links humanitarian assistance to the three components of uh, the triple nexus, which we've just been hearing from the first speaker. And um, this consensus uh, seeks to bring a connection between uh, delivering humanitarian assistance and um, long-term development, uh, as well as uh, having a peace building as an intersection of the two other components. Next slide. Um, how does conflict affect education in uh, our program in Omugo? Conflict affect education efficiency ratios, as you can see, for example, uh, learner to teachers uh, ratios uh, as um, standardized by Ministry of Education in Uganda, uh, is supposed to be uh, one to 53 learners, but the reality is really overwhelming. Uh, as you can see, there's an average of one teacher attending to 71 children and above. Uh, we have uh, caregivers to learners ratio, more especially at the ECD. Uh, the reality is really way above the, the standard, uh, according to the ECD framework. Uh, when you look at, um, uh, learners to, 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 to desk ratio, the standard is uh, three learners to one desk, but on average there are five and even more learners who sit on one desk. And uh, that is really so, uh, uh, it's so constraining, especially in terms of attendance and concentration of children in, in the class. And this speaks straight to a lot of overcrowding because of uh, yeah. this uh, resource constraint. Textbooks to learners ratio, still the same uh, story as uh, the above. We are, we are also looking at uh, differences in the education standards between uh, the host country and the country of uh, origin for the refugees, where we, we, we've learned that um, the education standard of Southern Sudan is quite different uh, from uh, that of Uganda. And this has affected the uh, equation, uh, equating the, the academic uh, qualification with which our learners from uh, uh, Southern Sudan come with. Uh, 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 furthermore, when you look at uh, the loss of learning times, as for the new arrivals, we have registered uh, a lot of loss of learning times for the learners. As a result of conflict, uh, learners take so long during evacuation, during transit, and also registration and reception processes when they arrive, as well as um, settling them to the mainstream uh, settlements. Uh, so in this case, World Vision Uganda through our program in Omugo, we are trying to explore options of implementing accelerated uh, education program uh, using the approved uh, model uh, to, to ensure that uh, some of the learners will lose time in terms of uh, new arrivals, uh, catch up with uh, our, our learning curriculums and then uh, the, the, the timings. Uh, lack, lack, of lack of documents for re-enrollment. Uh, we have had, uh, we're faced with cases where learners report loss of uh, these documents during transit, uh, but also uh, during conflict. 
So it, it has uh, really challenged uh, 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 the, the systems, the education systems to re-enroll uh, learners. We, we are looking at inter-settlement movements that affects uh, retention of learners at schools. Uh, reunification stood out really very strongly. Uh, reunification of uh, learners or children is a, a very important component of protection, but in this case, uh, we are looking at it in terms of uh, how uh, it uh, affects our retention of children and learners. But also, this includes other movements uh, which are not basically re re reunification. Uh, some of uh, the migration for other uh, uh, interests uh, which uh, affects our retention of learners. Uh, we, we are looking at uh, over-reliance on aid for education services. Poverty is a, is a big issue here where parents cannot really ably support education uh, initiatives as they would desire. As well as uh, government support is inadequate when we look at uh, the capitation grant. Capitation grant is, um, is one of the grants that are provided by the government to all the government schools uh, on a timely basis. These are seriously reduced and has affected um, uh, uh, the, the facilitation or the support of education uh, processes. And this affects more the conflict uh, torn zones or the, the fragile uh, areas. Effects of conflict on the learners. Uh, we all know that uh, uh, the, 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 this effect is so biting and uh, one of uh, it uh, which we have uh, encountered so much in our programming because our children suffering trauma, uh, a lot of mental and psychosocial uh, uh, psychological issues that affect uh, their, their, their learning. So uh, our program in Omugo has um, put together a lot of mental health and psychosocial activities integrated in schools and integrated in clubs. Uh, so that uh, learners uh, cope up with some of the, the, the effects that are uh, 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 slowing down uh, their, their, their engagement in the learning sphere. Uh, next slide, please. Yes, um, the, how is the project sensitive to, 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 to conflict? Uh, our programming in um, Omugo and in West Nile, just like I mentioned in the first slide, uh, is aligned uh, to the, the three components in the triple nexus. So as you can see, um, we, are, we are promoting uh, peaceful uh, coexistence through peace building initiatives and engagements. We target uh, refugees and host, uh, nationals in our programming uh, in terms of uh, promoting peaceful dialogues between communities uh, host and uh, refugees, but also among refugees, because there, there are many tribes of uh, refugees within their settlements. And we know that uh, one of the biggest um, uh, cause of the conflict in southern Sudan is uh, intertribal conflict. So we do a lot of peaceful uh, uh, dialogues among the, the, the refugees and also between refugees and host community. In terms of encouraging both us and refugee communities, local leaders, uh, to take uh, responsibilities in managing uh, and supporting education initiatives uh, within the, 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 the context where we are operating. In terms of uh, establishing and empowering peaceful peace clubs in school, uh, we support establishment and empowerment of uh, children's structures for peace building. Uh, transformational you development. Have one, one vision. Uh, one, one vision designs. One vision has designed a, a program to address uh, some of the long-term transformational development needs. Uh, we implement in our program comprehensive refugee response framework and uh, and the SDA, the Settlement Transformative Agenda. We empower caregivers and we support transition of the ECD to be registered and licensed as part of a, a long-term uh, program. In emergency, as you can see. We've uh, trained staff, supporters, and volunteers on do no harm so that there's conflict sensitive as we deliver the program mandate. Uh, like it was presented in the first presentation, uh, uh, we, we are part of the uh, Education in Emergency Advocacy team or partners, and we've just been having one of the advocacy events on education uh, recently. 
and this uh, supports a lot uh, in uh, voicing out some of the education needs in emergency. Providing incentives to the caregivers to promote continuity of learnings and, and, and also functionality of the, 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 the centers. Uh, in terms of uh, lessons, what have we learned? We've learned uh, a number of things, but I'm we are able sorry. to share with you this. Uh, to interrupt, but uh, you know, you have very few time left. So if you could speed up a bit. Thank you. Yes, uh, we've learned about our transition and sustainability of ECDs. Uh, key on this is licensing and registering uh, the ECDs uh, under government so that uh, they are supported in terms of supervision, monitoring, regulation and controls. Distribution of ECD centers in the communities to promote attendance of uh, children. They don't have to move so long uh, to access school. School feeding program, this has been really key and outstanding in, in supporting enrollment, but also ensuring good health. And above all, uh, children um, uh, are, are retained in school. Uh, and, and, and we know that um, in our context, many households uh, live on one meal per day and uh, having midday meals at school uh, promotes a lot of uh, retention. Education should go hand in hand with psychosocial support. I've talked about this. I will not uh, uh, repeat this. This is a good learning. Opportunities. Uh, we have uh, existing community structures. Uh, we have uh, the child protection structures. We have the local leaders. We have the, uh, the school management, the parents and the teachers association. So they support this initiative and they support education of children and learners in emergencies. Strong partnerships and collaborations with institutions such as schools and authority, such as uh, government and uh, United Nations agencies for refugees. Uh, referral and linkages for the target beneficiaries, such as children with special needs. We do a lot of uh, gender sensitive and disability inclusive programming in our education uh, program. And uh, we, we do a lot of linkages and referrals uh, externally and uh, internally. Existence of advocacy forum like education in emergency working groups, where World Vision Uganda and specifically World Vision program in Omugo is a subscriber uh, to this working group at a local, regional and national level. Thank you so much. Uh, back to you, moderator. Yeah, uh, these are some of the pictures. Yeah, um, great. CFS, home learning and uh, these are just evidence in terms of pictures of uh, how our program are impacting children and learners. Uh, within the, the context where we are operating. You can see an ECD session there, and you can see a child-friendly space session. You can see number counting during life skills sessions, and, and, and as well as our home learning, which was promoted during uh, our COVID-19 uh, pandemic uh, uh, times. Thank, Thank you, you so Thank much. You, Thank you very much. And if you have any question for Samuel, we will have a few minutes after the, the presentations to get back to you. Thank you very much. So over now to Roberta. She's based on speaking in Italy and uh, she will be telling us about also peace building and reconstruction in communities suffering from conflict in Mozambique. And uh, Roberta, 10 minutes, please. Yeah. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you. I hope you're hearing me well. Um, so, um, what I would try, uh, what I want to try to present this afternoon, is um, a very um, local experience of promoting peace education in a post-conflict setting in central Mozambique. Um, so, um, I will give a brief overview of the context where we work and then uh, I will try to explain what does it mean to put uh, peace education into practice in such a context and why it could be relevant for um, putting in practice the nexus. Uh, so, the project I'm referring to was implemented started in 20, starting in 2016 in Gorongosa district, which is a district of Sofala province in central Mozambique that was affected by a conflict starting uh, that started in 2012 that disrupted local economic activities as well as access to school, health and basic rights uh, in general. Um, as an organization, uh, we've been working in Gorongosa district for 30 years and we were involved since 2016. That is 
um, at a time where um, the conflict seemed to be like almost going towards its end, uh, we were involved in infrastructure rehabilitation uh, of schools and health centers and support to the recovery of local livelihoods. Um, what was discussed with local stakeholders, communities, activists, uh, community-based organization was the fact that um, for a sustainable reconstruction and peace building and for recovery. Um, yes, infrastructural rehabilitation was relevant, support to economic activities was relevant, but what was really important as something that would keep everything together was trying to reconstruct the social fabric of Gorongosa that of course, had been disrupted by the conflict as well. Um, the origin of that conflict were to be found in the marginalization of Gorongosa rural communities from local power structures and from development dynamics that had benefited only a few, whereas the others remain, uh, as I said, marginalized. So um, peace education was identified as a methodology that uh, would allow for a collective analysis of local conflicts, and I'm using the plural for a reason, and I'm going to explain why in a second, uh, a collective analysis of the drivers of local conflicts, and then to design and put in practice non-violent solution, focusing on schools and the surrounding communities. We focused on, we focused on schools because Help Code has been working for 30 years on, on, on schools and support, uh, particularly to primary schools in Gorongosa. Uh, but we focused on schools also because we understood the school as a space and a place that could be considered like the hearth of a community at a time of reconstruction. Uh, what is also relevant to say is that while this process was ongoing uh, as a um, you know, process that was trying to respond to the consequences of that conflict, a cyclone happened, the cyclone died in 2019, affected the area as well. And then a DDR process uh, was also on its way. So this context was characterized by multiple crises and um, some conf like latent conflict situation. Um, this slide uh, focuses on the theoretical framework of the peace education methodology that was promoted. I'm not going to focus on this right now, but we can discuss that later. What I want you to, uh, what I would like you to get from this part is that the, the theoretical framework of the peace education methodology that was implemented comes from the popular pedagogy from uh, Augusto Boal and, and Paulo Freire, and most of the tools that were used to put peace education into practice come from popular pedagogy. Uh, so on to the next slide, please. Um, what does it mean to do peace education in practice? For us, uh, it meant involving a variety of stakeholders at local level. Mm -hmm. Therefore, we worked with teachers, with the school councils, with students and their families, with women's groups, with community-based organizations, local consultative councils, uh, and the local institution as well, um, to discuss what peace education means. And here we also refer to uh, I think a well-known framework that has been designed and developed by UNESCO um, back at the beginning of the 2000s with um, a few updates over the year. Uh, what are the tools? And then based on this, on this, we launched a participatory action research on local conflicts. And as I was saying before, we refer to conflicts in plural because uh, and this was a key challenge at the beginning, we realized that it was very, that it would have been extremely difficult and complicated to see conflict only as armed conflict and only as the armed conflict that had affected the, uh, that area in, the, in, the, in, the, in those recent years. 
whereas it was more appropriate to discuss conflict in general as a characteristic of people's daily lives. Um, this was crucial for the success of the initiative, first because, of course, uh, people weren't really willing to discuss what had just happened with the armed conflict conflict. They weren't feeling safe and we understood that it wasn't uh, uh, yet the right time to discuss uh, what was that conflict. Um, but also it was crucial because beside that armed conflict, uh, there were a variety of more or less explicit conflicts that were affecting people's daily lives and um, that were, of course, affecting the recovery process and the reconstruction process and peace building um, in Gorongosa. Uh, this participatory action research um, was aimed at identifying the key conflicts that communities uh, were facing every day, and particularly those conflicts that um, had an impact on children's access to school and education. Um, based on this, uh, a series of peace education activities uh, were put in place uh, to address these local conflicts that have been identified, including um, <coughs> Uh, pieces based on the theater of the oppressed methodology uh, or legislative theater, uh, community dialogues and community training, mobile cinema, poetry, art, dance that were realized both in the schools and within the surrounding community. Um, we had a <clears throat> two weeks peace caravan whereby uh, these activities were brought from village to village in order to involve all those villages that weren't specific target of the action. And the project uh, um, came to an end with the development approval and committed commitment toward a pilot plan for peace education that was approved at district level. Um, if you go to the final slide, I would like to share some lessons learned here. Um, I partially mentioned that, including the fact that, for example, schools can be considered, or this is the idea uh, that we had at the beginning and that we think it's, it, it, it was still valid at the end of the process. That is that school can be considered the earth of a community. Um, a space of reference, of learning, of dialogue, of play, um, not only for youth, but also for their families and community members. And of course, humanitarian crises can create or exacerbate barriers uh, in access to school. And in our experience, peace education as a methodology can help make these barriers explicit and contribute uh, to um, addressing this barrier in a non-violent way. So um, the first take home lesson is that making conflict, uh, even community conflict explicit um, through a methodology such as peace education, keeping in mind that children that go to school often are those who suffer more during a humanitarian crisis, um, can be a relevant tool for building the nexus. Um, and we saw that peace education indeed is an effective methodology to promote an open dialogue about conflict as part of people's everyday lives and about possible participatory collective solution um, to, this, uh, to this conflict. And <clears throat> in our experience, um, promoting peace education um, in this way, contributed to social cohesion because, again, conflicts were made explicit, but at the same time, it provided the tools to analyze and resolve this conflict. And one of the key conflicts that were identified, just to give you an example, was the fact that in a situation of poverty exacerbated by conflict, families were 
um, deciding not to send children to school and particularly girls because marrying girls was considered um, an emergency livelihood strategy. So that was a very clear conflict because the school uh, environment, in particular the school council, that has the mandate of making sure that all the children of the community go to school, um, and the families that were struggling, and therefore, while being aware that uh, um, school is important, they thought that it was more important to marry their daughters uh, um, in order to obtain the bride wealth. Uh, recreational activities uh, were uh, quite critical, again, I think in the success of this uh, initiative. And by recreational activities, I mean, again, mobile cinema, theater, art, dance, music, sport, uh, local storytelling, including by involving the, the local radios. Um, and it's a good way uh, for children and the community to increase their knowledge about rights using tools that are well known uh, in that context. So it was nothing new, but it was about using dance and theater and art in a way that addressed the specific issues that we wanted to um, address. What, what we learned also is that, um, I mean, Today we are. Yes, I'm finishing. <laughs> yeah. No, that that was the last thing that I wanted to say, and it makes reference to the fact that uh, we are now discussing with the Ministry of Education in Mozambique and with the Education uh, Cluster um, that is active in the response to the Cabo Delgado crisis how to um, implement peace education activities in the yeah. Uh, humanitarian response uh, uh, in Cabo Delgado, which is something that we are currently doing actually in our protection activities and in the safe spaces um, with women and girls. Um, so that that's our experience, and I'm happy to discuss it more um, during after the, the all the presentation have been finished. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for this passionate presentation of your work. Um, and now over to Daria to present the work that Save the Children's Switzerland is conducting now in Lebanon. And you have two minutes. <laughs> Thank you very Thank you. much. So I will present about how we use education as a means to foster social cohesion in Lebanon. Uh, I'm presenting on behalf of our Save the Children Lebanon colleagues that are implementing the project. Uh, it's been a year that we are implementing it. In, uh, it's a three years project funded by the Swiss Agency for Development and Cooperation. Our aim here is to provide quality, safe and inclusive learning opportunities for vulnerable children in the Beka Valley of Lebanon. So we are working uh, at child level by providing non-formal education services at uh, caregiver and teachers level by uh, providing capacity building activities on how to uh, support children's continuity of learning and their well-being. And uh, finally, we are also working with community and governance at governance level to advocate for accessible, inclusive and quality education and social, social stability. So the actual context in Lebanon is affected by a multiple crises. Uh, there is, a, of course, the Beirut blast of last year, the effect of COVID-19. Uh, but also a political tension, civil unrest, and also an uh, ongoing economic crisis and inflation that is uh, leading to growing tension between uh, Lebanese host communities and also the Syrian refugees. There is also a perceived bias in the ads uh, that is mostly focusing on uh, Syrian refugees. Uh, the country was also affected by Poland's closure since uh, October 2019, so starting with the COVID-19 situation, but also uh, interruption and delays was caused by um, teacher strikes mostly. Uh, there is also an increase in the mental health and child protection concerns so that are leading to child labor, early marriage and uh, family violence. The Lebanese children in this context are also 
increasingly at risk of uh, dropout uh, of schools. So we are having uh, projects sensitive to all this situation uh, by different uh, means. First, we adopt a community-based approach. We include children, teachers, parents, and community leaders in the project at different bases. We, of course, have a transparent communication and collaborate with education actors, but also municipalities. Uh, we do have specific activities that include uh, Lebanese host communities and not only focusing on uh, Syrian refugees. We are working with a local partner who are well recognized and also aware of the local conflict dynamics. Uh, we always have risk assessments and uh, develop mitigation measures to manage it. Uh, we adopt also a conflict sensitive program management. Uh, that is also uh, the case of our partners. And finally, uh, we have also a very core component of this uh, project, which is a conflict analysis that is supported by uh, SDC consultants. This conflict analysis is specific to education and uh, the local context in which the project works. The aim of this uh, analysis is to identify the conflict sensitivity measures and uh, based on that, we'll develop specific activity to um, promote the social cohesion in the area that we are actually working. So the project aims to, to contribute to peace at two levels, the project level, but also at advocacy level. It's important here that uh, to highlight that these activities are just about to start and uh, that because of the current tensions, uh, we might need to readapt or redesign uh, them for conflict sensitivity uh, reasons. So our initial aim is to uh, first integrate the social cohesion value and so the social cohesion and the values of uh, respect, equity, inclusion into our regular uh, non-formal education activities. So they design and develop and integrate specific session on social cohesion uh, concept. And uh, all the material will be contextualized to Lebanon. We want also to add to develop some extracurricular activities for Syrian and Lebanese children uh, with a special focus on social cohesion. So this will be mostly recreational activities. The aim here is to create a safe space but more informal and playful uh, to give the opportunity to children to uh, get to know each other but also develop a positive relationship. And uh, we are also working uh, with parents, so we developed the parents community groups uh, that is uh, already existing in different projects, but here we want to add social cohesion sessions to the existing uh, guides. And uh, these uh, parent community groups are targeting both uh, Lebanese and Syrian parents. Uh, finally, at national level, we are advocating for the coordination, but also for comprehensive support to the most vulnerable population with a triple nexus perspective. So in this project, uh, we had different challenges, but also uh, lesson learned. First, uh, for us, it was difficult to bring both Lebanese and children uh, in the same space during the same time because of different shifts at school. Um, it's also really important to carefully plan the social cohesion activities in a conflict sensitive way, especially when there are uh, ongoing tensions within the communities. For example, so it's for us, the objective is rather implicitly um, speaking of social cohesion rather than explicitly having session directly uh, about the concept itself. Um, for example, during this summer, we were planning to develop some session on social cohesion for parents, but we had to postpone it because uh, there were a rise in the tensions between the two communities. Um, we want to, so it's important also for us uh, to address the vulnerabilities of the host communities as much as possible, and including them to the activity of the project. Um, it's important to develop the ownership of the project through a transparent communication and collaboration with the local authorities and communities. 
And uh, so we wanted also to highlight the importance again of the coordination and advocacy activities at national level. Finally, for us, it's more it's primordial here in this context to have this triple nexus approach uh, to ensure the equal access to quality education for all the children in Lebanon. And that's it. For me. Thank you very much. Thank you, very much. Also for keeping that. <laughs> okay, so uh, now it's time maybe for 10 minutes question and answers. Um, we can have your questions. You can uh, you can speak or you can write down your question in the chat, and we have our question here uh, orally. So anyone who would uh, I give the priority to <laughs> online the, yeah audience so. Do you, is there any question? Uh, maybe you have me because I cannot see myself. Do you yes, have any, any questions? No, not so far. Okay, so if uh, if you want to have uh, to to participate, maybe you you raise your hand and we'll listen to you. Thank you. Any questions in the in the room? I have one. Yes, please. I think it would be for you, Sarah. Because you mentioned that uh, applying the triple nexus approach will include shifting the emphasis uh, in financing mm -hmm. education. So, what would it take, in your opinion, from a for a donor yeah. or from a financing perspective? Yeah. To so to practically. That's a very good question. So the question is about how to shift financing models and approaches. So as for all of us, the first step is becoming familiar with the, the importance of a triple nexus approach. So Don't we, can you speak a bit louder? Louder, yeah. That they cannot sorry, uh, sorry. So the question um, was about um, shifting approaches to uh, financing. This is, of course, a major determinant of uh, sometimes of what we feel or our, our organizations are able to engage in. So I think as for all of us, the first step is also um, raising awareness among donors of the importance of a triple nexus approach. It is happening, of course, through policy dialogues, but it also needs to happen at the table when conceptualizing projects. Because there's still the quantity over quality orientation, there's still short funding cycles. We need to really, really repeat and repeat why is it important, especially not only in education, but especially in education, why is it important to have a longer term horizon? Why should we have a longer term financing and more flexible financing? Because we want to build into the financing those community based needs assessments. We can't just say, OK, here's here's the project already done and dusted and we're just going to implement it the way it is here on paper. It has to also have this adaptive management component. So that adaptive management has to be built into the project and program planning timelines. And so a lot of it is uh, is about raising awareness, I think, among donors. And then, of course, having more frank and flexible conversations among agencies. How, if we get a large pot of common funding, how are we going to distribute that funding? With what logic in order to optimize the comparative advantage of our organizations? We have to be honest about what we're capable of and what we're not capable of so that we don't have humanitarian actors trying to do the development work, development actors trying to do the humanitarian work. There's kind of a fuzzy line here. We need to be honest about what our competences are and how they intersect and complement each other, and then to try to distribute budgets in a way that will reflect those things in an optimal. But it's not easy, uh, so it's, it's a conversation, I think, an ongoing conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah, for this explanation. Any other question? People online, you can also unmute yourselves if you want to ask some questions. Question if there isn't anything to do online. Um, it could be for any of the yeah, yeah. Any, large organizations. Any, yeah. any of the large organizations that deal with the, uh, the big donors, so STC or World Vision. Um, how do you um, mitigate with the sort of power imbalances that you encounter when you are? designing initiatives 
with the police nexus. So how is a large organization that you aware that you are not sort of um, dominant in that conversation when you're designing initiatives? That could be for World Vision or STC, I guess. <laughs> Does any of the World Vision colleagues want to respond? Noemi or Samuel, maybe? Did you understand the question? Ah. So the question was how larger organizations can mitigate, you know, a bit also their, you know, in a way, dominance or, you know, in designing such interventions, um, which can be, of course, also be perceived as, you know, uh, biased in the conflict or by, by some conflict parties, you know, these international organizations could be perceived as being biased and so also part of the conflict actors, of course. Is that... Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure, Noemi, whether you would like to respond, maybe? I think I would ask the colleagues from Uganda if they... Godfrey, I think he, he would be ready to answer the question. Please, Godfrey. You... Yeah, uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for that question. And hope you can hear me. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Uh, about that question, we are, we are managing that by making sure that the, we put beneficiaries and the communities at the center of programming through the approach called AAP. AAP stands for accountability to the affected populations, whereby we don't consider beneficiaries as simplistic aid recipients, but as key stakeholders in the work we do. This is through involving them in the in planning, designing, and implementing of these programs. And uh, what vision, as what vision Uganda, we do this. Our, our emphasis is premised on, on the accountability, standing, uh, standing operating procedures that have the four pillars. The first one being information sharing, uh, make sure that beneficiaries have information about the project, participation, making sure that they also participate, and then uh, also collect their feedback through the complaints and response mechanisms. So that's how we are managing that, and uh, they are really at the center of programming. We don't impose uh, services on them, but uh, they decide uh, what to have and not what to. Thank you and over. <laughs> Thank you so much, Godfrey. Yeah, maybe from Save the Children's side, I can also add that in such contexts in particular, of course, it makes sense also to work through local partners, you know, who might, you know, have a better, you know, reputation and relationship with the local communities um, and not to become so visible as an international NGO, of course. I mean, it can be also a security risk to our local staff if they drive around with safe the children cars, of course. And, you know, there's like this is part of all the risk mitigation measures which need to be decided uh, accordingly based on the conflict analysis that we need to do every day in every every critical context that we work. And we're also especially we don't want to expose our local staff or beneficiaries to any risks. Is there any other questions from the online participants? Uh, so sorry, dear colleagues. Please, yes. Hello, everyone. I'm Ozim from Kabul ECI office. Uh, I, you know, uh, from my experience and understanding, especially in our uh, country situation and current situation, I, I can say about the peace building as I ask the questions. Uh, right now in our country, the uh, situation is so complicated. Uh, working with community uh, closely is not so easy. From one side, you know, the strict religious leaders who are leading or, you know, in the power in the country. From other side, you know, the, the uh, most of the educated people, they are leaving the country. This is also the, the problem in current situation. Uh, we are closely working with community-based education. In terms of the presentation that I, uh, you know, uh, followed with the colleagues who presented nicely, our situation totally different from uh, African countries or other Asian countries. Here is uh, many challenges in terms of, you know, girls' education, as you know about, 
and also especially the uh, in current situation boys also facing the, the same problem because totally i can say that uh, right now slowly the taliban's regime they want to change the schools the boys schools into religious madrasas this is also the big challenge in progress. sorry but we are a very limited in time if you could ask your question please yeah yeah the question is uh, i want to learn from your you know uh, expertise about the peace education and also how to work in education and emergency project that we uh, we are running right now and implementing this project in in the around the Kabul and the provinces I want to learn from you and also please share all of the practice materials with me because I'm technical assistant with the team, especially with training team. I'm working closely with them. Uh, I can use these practical materials in our training. Thank you. Thank you Thank so much. Thank you so much, Hasim, for sharing also your experiences. And uh, we can say all the materials in this webinar, including the recording, will of course be shared. And that's exactly the purpose to learn all from each other, including we are looking forward to learn from you. Um, and I think that's a good transition also to the group work. Um, uh, we have now roughly one hour uh, to discuss in groups because this is really also a workshop where all the participants should be able to engage and learn from each other. Um, so we suggest to split uh, the participants in two groups and for simplicity we will do one group with the face-to-face -face participants here in Geneva and another one with the uh, online participants. Um, and the first group, the online group, um, can discuss the question what programmatic recommendations can be shared for education projects in triple nexus contexts. Uh, and the second one, what key advocacy messages can be formulated around the role of education in triple nexus contexts? So these are the two proposed questions and um, you will have uh, 20 minutes time to discuss this in the group um, and to put the results of your discussion in a tablet. Um, so I can quickly show you how this looks. If you enter, if you click on these links in the presentation, you will get to this Padlet. It's a kind of online whiteboard where you can um, make new entries by double clicking. I can just Oh, sure. sorry, sorry. Can you maybe show the links or should I? If you click on the links. Sorry. We are trying to show that also in the shared screen. So I will join the online group um, and the face to face group will organize themselves here in the room. Exactly. That's how the whiteboard looks like. Uh, you can click on the plus to make new entries or you can double click also on the on the colored screen. And we will come back um, at around um, uh, 14.40 to share results in the, in the plenary again. So have fun uh, discussing together and uh, we look forward to the results, which will be also very nice outcomes of this, of this webinar that we can further share and disseminate. And I think we will stop the recording now for the group work and I will join the online participants out. Yeah, okay. So yeah, exciting discussion in the online group as well. And I think here in the room as well, as far as I could see. So many thanks for all your active contributions. Um, would somebody from the Geneva group like to briefly wrap up your discussion in five minutes? What were the main points? I mean, we will also share the um, Padlet results, of course, with everybody as an output of this workshop. Um, but just to give um, the others a glimpse of, of your discussion points roughly. Who would like to wrap this up? <laughs> I can start and then maybe yeah. others can add. So Thank you. When we, obviously, we have different type of actors, for which we need different advocacy messages. 
I think the discussion overall was more focused on the development and humanitarian actors and donors. Especially with, for example, the donors, we highlighted a need for more flexibility, long term support, and then we could get this by highlighting the importance of sustainability and also the advantages of sustainability for them. Mm -hmm. Then also with the humanitarian and development actors, we also highlighted that we need new innovative ways of thinking and solutions and more cooperation and instead of like fighting for the funds we need like to work together to fight for the communities as you could say and yeah particularly here also obviously that it's all inclusive and then in the end we try to find some key messages for why education is so important in this nexus and there we highlighted different aspects such as security development gender equality which all are dependent on education and then obviously if you lack this quality inclusive education that you have no development and very dire consequences. Excellent. Thank you so much. Would anybody else like to add this from group Geneva? <laughs> Otherwise, I would like to ask uh, Jessica to briefly um, wrap up the discussion in the online group. Yeah. Um, so key points that came across in the programmatic context. Um, Taking a conflict, uh, taking a pro an approach to programming that integrates conflict analysis from the very start of the project design, um, including not just looking at kind of the the obvious conflicts, but also um, smaller scale community level conflicts, um, and making sure that approaches are aligned with that. Um, important to involve uh, children, but also caregivers, parents, communities, and authorities at every level of programming. Um, need to ensure that education, um, I think there was a there was an idea that education is particularly prone to siloed thinking, which I would agree with, and uh, to make sure that um, approaches are well coordinated with other sectors or clusters in, in their contexts. For example, um, the idea of safe spaces, uh, there's a clear link with uh, protection. Um, making sure that any uh, any data or research on particularly on conflict analysis is shared between organizations or agencies to maximize impact and minimize duplication. A close partnership with governments from the very earliest stages of programming to ensure other sus the sustainability and durability of um, programming and the example from Uganda was given um, around the, um, the way that a number of the ECD centers and learning um, centers there are currently transitioning to government through going through the registration and standardization um, to align them with government approaches, which is fantastic. Um, so uh, the use of arts and creative activities in peace education is very important, but there's a need to strengthen the involvement of authorities in these activities. Um, mainstreaming of um, of peace education in education programming and also like the, the sort of less obvious things such as nonviolent communication um, and conflict resolution. Um, particularly on education, consider formalization pathways from the very earliest points of program design. So for example, if you're doing an, an NFE program or an ALP program, um, make sure that you have some sort of understanding of how that learning is going to be regularized or recognized by um, formal government actors. And if those processes aren't in place, think about what needs to, what needs to take place for that to take place. Um, someone brought up the point of the importance of selecting implementation partners that are well perceived and trusted by all members, um, all, all sides of a, of a conflict, and that's, I think, particularly important at, um, at, the, at community level. Um, establishment of a learning agenda at the design stage of projects, so making sure that um, any research, any learning that's coming out of the project um, is aligned with government priorities, and I think that's a, a key way whereby education programming can influence and feed into policy development at the government level. Um, and I think one really key point that came out is, I mean, I, I think 
the extent to which um, I don't think, I mean, perhaps I'm just speaking from my own experience, but how difficult it is to actually do meaningful nexus work. Um, and I think that relates to the, the discussion that was taking place in the other group and the point that was raised in the plenary session about the need to advocate to donors about building in a, a triple nexus approach to funding opportunities uh, to make sure that actually, if you're going to take a triple nexus approach, it's not just an afterthought that you tag on to your humanitarian project or your development project or your peace project. It's something that needs to be actually integrated into the design of the project from the very earliest stage. Um, I hope that's okay. If there's any points that I missed or anything that wasn't clear or was incorrect, please feel free to jump in and correct. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you so much, Jessica. Okay. Is it better now? Yes, I think so. <laughs> so thank you so much. Excellent. Is there if there is any question on this wrap up or additional comments, um, please shout now. <laughs> Otherwise, uh, we will share these Padlet results. I think it's a very nice output also of this joint workshop, capturing a bit like the wealth of all your inputs and experiences. And uh, I hope you enjoyed the discussions. And then I hand over to Ulla to close the webinar. Yes, thank you. You've done it very well. So no need for more. So thank you for participating in this workshop. I mean, the I hope we all learned something and we will start working also together because we, we understand now that collaboration is uh, is key for the nexus to be really um, effective. And thank you for those who are online for, for being patient with us and to participate. I see that the Padlet reflects a lot of interactions and I yeah, I'm looking forward to having other events with all of us and uh, we will share all these outcomes in, um, I think we will synthesize, we will not to do it this way. And you will also have the PowerPoint. And thank you very much. It will be on the website of Pressy, and I think you will send yes, it by email. I'm just collecting the email addresses for, because not all of you have, I think, registered through the website. So just to make sure we have all the email addresses um, for the online participants, um, I think we have all the email addresses. If not, please uh, send them to us or share them now in the chat. Um, thank you so much. So we can make sure to share really the outcomes of this webinar with all of you. Um, and they will be on the rest of the website at some so, point, yeah. but that might take so, some more time. So that's why just to make sure not to lose uh, the connection. And uh, thank you very much for the online participants. I hope you also enjoyed this webinar and hope to see you next time again with us. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. 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 Thank bye -bye. you. Bye-bye.